Hey, Nora. Hey, Sandy. What's up? How was your week? How is your weekend? What's going on? Oh, I'm so good. I'm so good. I have one of our biggest fans at my house this weekend because that's how we treat our fans, everybody. Oh, I mean, also I'm related to him. (laughs) It's my cousin, Matt. So, (laughs) hey, Matt, if you're listening, um, you're already back home and uh, you were a great guest. Uh, But it's been it's been really, really nice because I went from having absolutely no family to having a full house full of visitors and there's nothing that beats that. Oh my gosh, that sounds great. Hey, Matt. I know Matt. Hey, Matt. Thanks for listening. <laughs> and you know what I did this weekend? I might be, do I sound a little hoarse? Probably not. No, you sound not. not hoarse at all. Okay, that's great. Because we had an amazing Capoeira event uh, on Saturday. And uh, for some reason, <laughs> I spent most of the time singing. I was like really early on into uh, the chara, which is what we call when we uh, play a game or spar. Um, someone like looked at me and was like, come, come, come up here and play the pandero, which is um, the instrument that kind of looks like a tambourine. Come play the pandero and start singing. And I was like, me? Because I'm, I, I'm not... You know, usually it's uh, someone who's much more experienced than me that would who, then, who would be doing that. And he was like, yeah, you got a great voice. Get up here. And I was like, OK, I'll do this for a little bit. And then you, you kind of you do that. And then you like look at people to like take your place uh, eventually. And everyone just avoided my eyes for like 45 minutes. <laughs> so I, was Come just, on. <laughs> I was just singing forever. They're like, it's great. You have a great voice. So, I mean, I guess like ego stroked. Thanks very much. But <laughs> It was like um, a full-on performance this weekend that I was not expecting. Well, that's nice. It was nice. (laughs) That's amazing. I mean, sometimes you just have to be given the mic, you know? I mean, not you or me, (laughs) but like, you know, metaphorically, and then sometimes actually. (laughs) If, If only there was a mic and I wasn't yelling over the other instruments, but you know what? You said I'm not hoarse, so I'm feeling fine. In fact, I might even be feeling feeling grateful. Nora, I know that our spam continues to be an issue, but <laughs> have we figured out a way? Have we figured out a way to sift through it and find out who we should thank this week? Yes, we have. And I should start also by thanking all of the listeners that reached out to say, like, if we can help you with the spam, let us know. Um, it's it's just a question of time and going through and deleting and unsubscribing. And uh, yes, we do have a list of people that we can thank. So thank you so much to everyone that shares the podcast and likes it and, I don't know, tells us that it's awesome, tells other people that it's awesome. We really rely on that. Especially thank you so much to the financial contributions of Eric Ashlyn and Mary. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, folks, so, so much. So, Nora, guess what happened this week? Um, well, you know what happened? 30 centimeters of snow fall, fell in the last uh, 24 hours in Quebec City, and I cannot tell you how much that has made me feel amazing. <laughs> but that's probably not what you're talking about. No, it wasn't. And also, didn't you predict or didn't somebody predict that it was going to be the last ski weekend? I guess that's not true anymore. No. Well, I, it's hard to know because the, the temperature is not very low. So I don't know. I'm going to try to go skiing tomorrow, but it's going to be a sloppy mess, I think. Uh, well, good luck. No, that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about the great American equivalent to the throne speech. The State of the Union Address. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of hype around how Biden um, wasn't dead. You know, when the bar is on the floor, (laughs) I mean, like for all of the news to be like, oh, my God, he he seemed like an alive human and that to be good news. It's just like, wow, things are really awful. (laughs) That's your good news story. But like, whatever, listeners, this is no, this is not an American focused podcast and I'm not going to make it one, but, but, uh, there is a little bit of like Canadian ish news coming out of that. I think while well, I'm making it such, so do you know what, before you get into that, cause I think we've had a conversation about that specifically, but I just want to say that, you know, I was seeing a lot of people online, a lot of Democrats online who are so excited about how amazing the speech was. And I went to watch it to be like, oh, Biden woke up. That's interesting. And 
like the guy was on a tightrope where every possibility of falling was like with every word that he uttered. And when he was announcing like, and you know, NATO that we co-founded and NATO's got new members like, oh, what country is he going to say? What's he going to say? He's like, Finland. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Finland did join. That's right. You got that right, man. You didn't say fucking Togo or Brazil or something. Not right. But Sweden just joined. Did you mean Sweden? <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like every word that he got correct. I'm like, whoa, he he nailed that word. It was a very, very awkward speech to listen to. Yeah, for sure. And like the the moments where he did go off script, like that that very weird, bizarre moment where he uh, referred to undocumented migrants as illegals. Like uh, there was a lot that was like not great about that speech. And again, the bar is on the floor for for folks to like take a look at that and be like, wow, that was great. You know, it's because there was such an expectation of total failure. Um, but but there was a part of the speech where Biden spoke about um, the expensive cost of pharmaceuticals in his country, saying that, yes, saying that, you know what, in the future, because, you know, this wasn't like a State of the Union address, much like a throne speech that happens just before an election year. It was... It was a campaign speech. And one of the things that he said was that, you know, in the future, we will make sure that no American spends more than $2,000 a year on their necessary prescription drugs. Nora, does that not sound like a pharmacare plan? I don't know if that sounds like a pharmacare program, but that does sound like a liberal pharmacare program. I mean, Nora, it sounds more like a pharmacare program than we're going to pay for diabetes, drugs, and contraceptives. <laughs> okay, yes, fine. Yes, very good. <laughs> okay, so I have a new prediction for the podcast, okay? Oh, I, 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 I bet I know what this is going to be. Go ahead. Oh, my God, then fucking guess. No, no, I, go, I, I don't want to take your thunder. Like, I, I think I know where you're going, so go ahead with this prediction. I think you're probably going to be right. Okay, the prediction is... That if the Democrats win or if whatever, if the Americans, if the Americans create some sort of uh, public system in which uh, they are going to somehow uh, make it so that there is a limit, a top limit on how much people can pay for pharmacare in the U.S., Canada will finally create a pharmacare plan just before the Americans do that. That's my prediction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that locking in locks with what the Americans are doing uh, is what we do. And actually, we saw that when Canada announced this past week that they would be airdropping aid at the exact same moment that the United States announced that they would be airdropping aid into Gaza. So I think you're probably right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Canada, I mean, it's one of like the great parts of Amer of Canadian. Ugh. Gosh, keep messing that up. It's like not... <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, you know, kind of in Canada, America, like really, what is the difference? Um, uh, but it's, it's like one of the, the great parts of Canadian culture that we're able to say that we did something better than the United States. And so I think that there will be like a full on scramble to do it um, and, yep. and to, to do it in a way that can where Canadians can still say that in some ways it's better than the United States if if the United States takes that promise commitment seriously and moves on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a solid uh, little bit of staring at the United States and knowing what that means for Canada. So uh, you will get laurels when that comes true. I mean, unless it's stopped by the conservatives, which it might be. Mm -hmm. Well, but it wouldn't be if the Americans were doing it. <laughs> I just right. anyway, that's the <laughs> prediction. And this podcast is good at predictions. And we should mention another prediction that we made um, a, a few months ago. Uh, is it a few months ago? Yeah, it is. Right. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Another prediction that we made a few months ago has come to pass. So when uh, when Canada joined a lot of other countries around the world, uh, pulling funding from the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, um, which provides crucial uh, services to people living in Gaza, um, clearly uh, as a uh, some sort of response to uh, the International Court of Justice's um, 
rulings on uh, on what Israel uh, is doing, and it's uh, and and uh, saying that Israel has a responsibility to prevent a genocide from occurring. Uh, remember that it was just a, a few short months ago. Uh, we predicted that um, Canada would reverse its decision because it mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. an unsustainable. Uh, it was like an un. Uh, defensible position, an indefensible uh, position to hold that we would uh, remove this funding from this crucial and necessary agency um, unless we were just, um, you know, going to uh, more fervently support genocide um, than, you know, the, the sort of quiet way we had been doing. And uh, and it's come to pass, Nora. Uh, the 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 position has been reversed, and Canada will be um, again funding uh, UNRWA, uh, and that was announced this week. Yeah, yeah. Now the way that it was announced, pretty interesting, because there was supposed to be a press conference earlier this week in the morning. I forget what day, Wednesday, that Ahmed Hussein called Minister of International Development. And Sandy, did you see he like just canceled it and then they said nothing for like a day and a half about the announcement? Yeah, it was very, very weird. I wonder what was happening in the background on that. But I mean, perhaps it had something to do with some lobbying going on because did you see Siege's response? (laughs) <laughs> oh, did I see Siege's response? I mean, I, I'm cynical of any organization whose only response to criticism is we'll see you in court. But I do kind of look forward to how the Canadian Siege, so the Canadian Israel Jewish Affairs Association or Committee or whatever agency, uh, they've said that they're going to uh, sue the government for this decision to stop refunding UNRWA. And let's be clear, Canada actually hadn't stopped funding UNRWA. They hadn't actually mm-hmm. not sent a payment because payments were like figured out in advance, which is also like very interesting part about this timing that as April is coming and the payment would have had to have been stopped for April, that's when they decided to not, you know, to say that they would continue the funding. So Canada actually hasn't stopped funding, which is, you know, good news on the side of like bureaucracy. But yeah, Sija, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say like, what the hell are they thinking? They've lost the plot, but uh, because we know what they're thinking and they know the plot very well. But at what point are they like aiding and abetting genocide with what like the rhetoric is saying? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's pretty disgust. Like I just, I, I have no words for the level of like, based that that is like it's so gross and I mean especially as we continue to see what the situation is like this is getting worse and worse it's a famine now it's a genocide it's a famine uh it is uh it, it it's ethnic cleansing it's it's completely a complete decimation of 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 a people of a way of life of of like history of culture of all sorts of things of people of people and it's i mean gosh the the massacre that occurred this week um as people were uh trying to get food uh from idf forces um shooting into a crowd of people like it's it's unbelievable and um like okay CJ I guess if this is what you want your legacy to be right now sure um at CJ and other organizations who continue to take the weirdest of lines on all of this stuff but I mean here we are here we are um I'm you know I'm glad that this position could not stand. And uh, I think it has a lot to do with, again, how much resistance there's been on the ground. Uh, and yeah, I would I would love to know what was behind this sort of weird uh, pr- press re- conference uh, cancellation. But um, all that's to say, uh, I am I'm glad that our prediction was right on that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. And not related directly, but of course, conversations about this have been related to an invasion in Rafa, but uh, it's the start of Ramadan. So happy Ramadan to everybody who celebrates and good luck, especially in these first few days of fasting, which I understand are the hardest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, one more thing to mention before we get into the main story. Have you seen the case of the disappearing royal? <laughs> I was so hoping you would mention it and it is so out of the ordinary for us to talk about. So I have seen I mean, seen like, this. I don't care. No, of course not. <laughs> but you care enough if to it, be like, this is hilarious. And that is the level of caring that I think is fair. 
Yeah, like, what is happening? I mean, there's like the, these internet conspiracies that have now made it into the to the mainstream that um, the 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 princess. <laughs> just can't believe that word even came out of my mouth. The princess <laughs> is missing. <laughs> she hasn't been seen since, you know, she went to get some sort of abdominal surgery, solidarity sister or something, I guess. Since Christmas Day. Christmas Day. I mean, that's not, that was a long time it ago. It was. It was. Uh, and so, so people are like, where is she? What's going on? What's happening? And so I guess the, 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 the palace or the people who do the public relations stuff at the with in the monarchy were like, here's a picture of the said princess <laughs> with her kids. And the picture that they released was um, you know, covered by uh such newswire agencies as like routers and um the associated press and uh and Getty images. <laughs> and Getty images and a Apparently, these sources are now saying, Axe, stop, pull the image. It has been doctored, and a bunch of internet sleuths are like looking real deep at these photos and are like, oh my God, they have been doctored. Perhaps, perhaps this isn't the princess at all. Where is she really? What is happening? This is ridiculous. We should not have a monarchy. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. This is the first that I like I've seen people talking about Kate Middleton disappearing and I'm just like I don't I don't care a little bit at all like enough to look at what the hell people are talking about. But this photo coming out is so hilarious to me and it's hilarious to me in one very weird way. Sandy, my Facebook page has been taken over by AI images. Have you seen me post about this on Twitter? No, I haven't. Okay, so I've been posting the images that I've been getting on Twitter, and the images are like Jesus as a chariot, Jesus on board of an airplane saving people from drowning in the mud in what? an airplane. I've gotten pictures of a woman whose butt is like forward facing, but so is her torso. <laughs> it's hard to describe. Um, I, there's a picture of a Nora, woman who's. What is your what is your search? <laughs> engine history look like you know what i think it's because i've always had no personal details on facebook like not even my age and so i must just be in this world of like oh let's just push completely random shit to this person and because i have been looking at the ai images it's like then you get more obviously from that um the most recent was a woman who was basically a snake um being held by a hippie <laughs> it was like that's really fucking weird looking like she's like a snake so one of the, why am I even talking about this? One of the motifs that started this whole AI thing. Can I just, can I just ask a clarifying please. question? Are these ads? No, no, no. They're all groups and they're all like, oh, praise Jesus today or get good luck from Jesus being rescued by a flight attendant who's 10 feet tall and Jesus. And then, sorry, so how are they occurring in your feed as someone who's like basically never on, at, on Facebook anymore? Like, is that, are they just like suggested posts, like what Instagram does now? Or like, how are they getting into your feed? Yeah, they are suggested posts, but they don't say suggested. So they are literally just in my feed. It's as if I'm following all of these groups and they're just posting AI pictures all the time in my feed, even though I'm not following literally any of them. What? That's so, so weird. <laughs> it's really fucking weird. And so for, so this is, this is where it's gotten to now, right? So this is where the AI is at now. It's nuts. But for weeks before this, it was all AI pictures of the royal family. And so when I saw all AI generated pictures of the royal family, and, and, they're, and they're, again, they're like not real pictures, but they're not doing anything weird. So it's just like, oh, there's one of the kids. You're like, okay, I don't know who the fuck that is, but whatever. And so when I saw this picture of Middleton and her kids, I was like, oh, that looks exactly like all of the AI photos that I've seen for weeks on my, in my Facebook. <laughs> and then you look at the fingers, you're like, oh, wait, the kids' fingers are fucked up, and that's fucking weird, and the proportions are off there, and she looks strange. And you're like, oh, actually, there's a whole international national freak out because this picture was posted and if you look at british news they're saying like the picture was taken by prince william himself and posted online for mother's day because apparently i didn't know this either but the brits celebrate mother's day right now big surprise to me okay huh, okay and yeah and so that was why the picture was posted and it's just being taken apart by anybody that has any idea about photoshop or ai or the combination of the two explaining why it was so obvious and easy for these national, international journalism, photojournalism groups to be like, 
kill this picture. It's not an authentic picture, which then begs the question after this abdominal surgery, where is Kate? (laughs) Well, shit, that's bizarre. I just also went onto your Twitter to see the images that you're describing and folks, if you're listening, um, it's, it's worth, uh, I, I mean, they, they, they really escape description. Some of these photos, this is, I, uh, I mean, like I, I thought it was difficult to understand how a person's torso could be facing the camera and also their butt. But I mean, that was an accurate, that was accurate. Yeah. Um, did I? Yeah. Did I describe them well? <laughs> weird. Uh, the the hippie holding a woman without a leg. I don't understand what's really happening here. It's very bizarre. Um, that's very bizarre. It's not that she's missing a leg. She has only one leg. It's not like she's missing a leg. It's the body has a single leg. Yeah, that becomes a stomach. It's. I I don't really know. How, you really just got to go there and see it. <laughs> <laughs> that is I, I keep adding these pictures to it the whole suite of jesus uh, images is, are just nuts they're so they're so wild that's very weird but anyway um uh, kate Milton, uh congratulations on your escape uh i hope you're able to make it last <laughs> i hope so too and i do think it's like i mean she is going to be the queen very soon because the backdrop of all of this is prince charles or king charles or whatever he's like dying right so it is very strange that she has not given a sign of life <laughs> 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 anyway, the real topic. Nora, do you want to introduce it? Oh, you're going to throw it to me to introduce? Of course I am. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So, Sandy. Yes, Nora. Uh, let's say you, you and I are um, in a tragic situation together and we both die and we're, our funeral is being held uh, together. Mm. And someone stands up and yells, rest in power. And everyone's like, yes, rest in power, Sandy. And someone stands up and says, rest in power, Nora. And the whole room hushes, shocked to hear. (laughs) You can't say that. She's white. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, sometimes when you when you take arguments that happen on Twitter that like, you know, seem to be real on Twitter and then you like you say them out loud and you pretend that they're happening in real life, like the absurdity of them becomes really, really clear. But I think mm. it, it, it this this does beg us to talk about it because I think actually, Nora, you and I have been having conversations about this for years, not specifically this particular thing, but about this for years. And we haven't really delved into it on the podcast. And I think it's, I think it's really important. There's a couple of ways that we can come at this conversation. So just to give um, some background, uh, recently, uh, a member, a white member of the American military of the army, um, uh, in an act of protest as to what's happening in Palestine, self-immolated, uh, lit himself on fire in protest. And this, I mean, I, I, one of the, the weird things about seeing the reaction on Twitter was like, I guess, realizing that, I, I, I don't know, people don't know that that's a, a thing, like it is a, a form of protest that has been taken um, with some regularity. Like that's what, it is a form of of extreme protest that people do engage in. Um, And uh, I guess for some people seeing it online, it was something that was very new to them. But um, this this, uh, member of the military took this action uh, because uh, he you know, is witnessing, like many of us are, one of the most dire uh, situations uh, that we've seen in terms of another genocide um, occurring. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't have to rehash it. We've been talking about it for months on this podcast. And so uh, folks started to respond to this by saying rest in power in recognition of the fact that this man had had taken this action uh, uh, as an act of resistance and, you know, had taken his own life as part of that action. And then, and then, you know, instead of talking about the action or talking about what's happening in Palestine and Gaza, uh, there became this like bizarre argument on Twitter as to like whether or not that 
phrase could be used for this person because one, he's white, two, he's a member of the military, and uh, this should be a phrase that is uh, is just for black people. And I, I mean, there are so many ways that we can come at this conversation, but one um, that I saw you mentioned Nora on Twitter was that this is like deep, deep, like policing behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was like a lot of it came from a couple of different accounts and then there was a big discussion on whether or not these accounts themselves are police. And I think that that's not the, that's not the allegation. That's not the, that's not the conversation. It's not whether or not that person, those people, this person who says this is a cop. It actually is much more fundamental. There's two pieces at play here. And the first is this. When we are so interested in what people say, and it is not just this. I mean, we can, we can imagine many, many, many other examples of, of things people might say online that then other people jump in and say, you said that wrong, you shouldn't say that, or you don't have a right to say that. Actually, and there was a really interesting conversation around this, um, around Say Her Name, which was very much something that came after the, the death of Sandra Bland, who's a black woman at the hands of police. And gradually that evolved into something that you know, could be said in other situations, especially around trans women being murdered. You know, we would say, and we do say, say her name. Uh, and you can see the culture of um, remembrance kind of evolving on that online. But when you start to police language in that way online, it spins out in really weird ways because it's meaningless, number one, because there's no truth in this. You know, there's no objective, this is right and this is wrong, or you say this, you're good, or you don't say this and you're bad kind of thing. These are these are nebulous uh, things that all have nuance and history and experience. And as you say, you say them in real life and there's really no controversy. And so that's like kind of one thing. And the other side of this is we don't actually know who each other is online. We don't we don't know one another. We don't know the struggles that we're engaged in in terms of the activism that we've done. We don't know if people have credibility. We don't actually know if someone literally is a, a complete, not the person themselves, but it's like a, it's a sock puppet can, uh, account for a police officer, just like imagining all the ways to completely disorient people online. And that's really dangerous because we never know if we're having real conversations or authentic conversations online with people who say they are who they are because we literally have no way of knowing, which is the limit, of course, of Facebook um, and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok activism because there's, you know, the activism that we do in real life that is anchored in knowing someone and having experienced them in real life it can't really be replicated online. And the one thing I've been thinking so, so, so much about lately is that online you can literally justify anything through words. You can make a credible argument to justify literally anything online. That is not the same thing as then going into real life and testing what you've just argued online to see whether or not that's true. And that disconnect, I think, is really deadly because unless you're engaged with work on the ground, which not everyone is for many, 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 many legitimate reasons, you get lost in this world of what is right and what is wrong. And you've got an actual world of what is possible and what's less possible, depending on like the circumstances, the people you're organizing with, the campaign you're doing, the state power, how threatening you are to state power, who you are, how you're organizing, your level of wealth, all of these things, right? And um, that, of course, is not a conversation that's had online because online, if we remind people online that it's not real, the power that exists with being online evaporates. And then, you know, the people that make money from us being online need us to be back online. And so they become agents of chaos to chaos us up. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm going to come at this conversation in so many different ways uh, as we discuss it. But like one of the things that uh, this idea of police and who's police and who's not like one, I should just say like, I, one of the reasons I like can't engage on Twitter anymore is that I'm just like so sick of how many accounts are obviously just fake black accounts. They're not actual black people. And they're like, you know, they engage in whatever conversation as, as a black person, it's like always the first thing that they say. They're like some sort of anime character is their photo. And like their sole purpose is to like make some sort of uh, inter-community conflict of like who can be considered black, whether light-skinned people are black, whether biracial people are black. And it's like, I mean, I think it's serving a purpose. <laughs> I think it's serving a crucial purpose at this particular point in history. And I, you know, I think to myself in terms of like the, the, the police discussion that, um, that you raised, like 
Uh, there's something that we used to say to each other in person as activists, which was like, it doesn't matter if that person over there who's causing a problem is a police officer for real or not. Uh, if they are having the same impact as a police officer would have, then you treat them like they're police. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you just you you consider them as though they're police. And so I feel like that is like very lost in online conversations. Like you look at like some of the conversations that are happening and it's like, what what would power like to happen? When somebody has self-immolated and is trying to um, to, to pull attention to how awful um, the situation in, in Gaza is, how awful a genocide this is, what would power want to happen in that moment? It would want us to be distracted and to talk about literally anything the fuck else. And so if that is happening, <laughs> if that is the impact of what is happening, then that is as good as police behavior. And in this case, I mean, in we've spoken about this on the podcast before. We spoke about it uh, during a um, an audio session that we had on Twitter. I can't remember what those things are called. What is it called when you have those audio um, sessions? Spaces or something? Are they still spaces? Spaces, whatever. Yeah, uh, that like uh, there's a way in which on the left um, there is a lot of policing of each other that we do, and it's like, oh my god, stop it! Like there is no perfect way to be on the left. Like let it the fuck go. Like think about what. Um, our purpose is in any given issue. And for, for that, for that moment to be so completely taken over uh, by, by this policing of one another, like that to me, it's like, uh, it doesn't matter if it's actual police or not. There's some policing behavior going on. That's one. And like, we also, I think we should always be when we're engaging online or not, considering the impact of what is happening. Even if we do feel like, you know, that does seem like that's something for my community that I would like to, to hang on to or that has a particular um, uh, meaning in my community. I mean, fuck, let's think about the word woke, right? Like, like that's something that has a particular meaning in my community. And there's like discussions on Twitter about like gatekeeping it and so on. But what does that mean? How are you going to do that? You can't. You fucking can't. You cannot do it. And it's like, as a, as a community, um, you know, we, have, we continue to have our inter-community uh, words and culture that we have around these, these, um, these concepts and how they're used outside of the community. It's like, there's no amount of policing that can be done um, to stop that. It's, it's just never going to be done. And so, like, so, so what's the point besides, like, the argument that then results, which makes us feel what? (laughs) Like superior if we're on one side, non-superior if we're on the other side. Like what is the argument to the end? Like is it to make sure that some people like in the end at Nora's funeral won't say rest in power? I mean, okay, that's a goal, I guess. But if we, I mean, like think about that seriously, like the, the, the cost benefit analysis of that, of like um, trying to fracture people and trying to take attention away from uh, where we need attention the most to take organizing energy away where we need organizing energy the most. It's like, y'all, like not fucking worth it. Like we really, really have to think about the in real life implications of some of this shit. Well, and so what you were saying implies that people know how to treat a cop, which I actually don't. And I know that you don't think necessarily either that people know how to treat a police officer. That's a good point. Yeah. So someone shows up to your organizing meeting and, you you know, their shirts are like really well creased and their background story is really weird. (laughs) And they really, really, really want to be the treasurer. (laughs) What do you do? And I, I ask you, Sandy, this question, what do you do? I've, I have ideas too, because I've been in that situation a couple of times and I've helped other groups navigate that situation a couple of times. What do you do when you, someone shows up in your group and you think they're a cop? Well, there's, I mean, it depends on the situation. It depends on the type of organization that you have. It depends on the situation, but most of, I mean, like what you're going to try to do is make them as ineffective as whatever, it, uh, at whatever it is they're doing as possible. Yeah. 
That's the goal. Like just make them completely ineffective. And sometimes you might think that that means ignoring them or kicking them out, but sometimes that's actually not the way to make them the most ineffective because then they, they try to make you the bad guy, whatever. But, you know, like there's ways that you, you deal with that to just completely make them impotent in the group. You have to strategize around that. And that has to be a part of the way that has to be a part of the organizing strategy that you have. And, um, you know, in real life, these are ta- strategies that we have with one another and we, we share. And I, I mean, are they strategies that anyone at all ever talks about online? I don't think so. Mm, no. And so, you know, it's, it is very sensitive because there, there's certainly the phenomenon called snitch jacketing, which is to say that someone's a police officer to render them marginal or to, to shut them out of your organizing group or to slander them or whatever. And so that, that is a concern. You know, the last time that I dealt with this directly, um, we were doing a kind of organizing that really didn't matter if police were involved. We were doing really not radical stuff, but it was a kind of not radical stuff that I could imagine the state wants to keep a close eye on. So it was like, okay, well, you know, that guy wants access to these documents. Not going to happen. So we're going to make the argument in the meetings that that's not going to happen. And we're going to back channel each other if we have to talk to each other where he's not present. But otherwise, there's no problem. Like, we'll just, you know, give him really menial tasks. And to make sure that the guy who's on payroll of the cops at least has something to do and is helping us out with, like, logistics or something. Um, You don't always need to push someone out of a room and whether or not someone's a police officer doesn't really matter because if the issue is that they're being disorienting and not helpful and strange and um, and you don't trust them, well, you don't have to trust everybody that you're organizing with. If you're doing organizing that isn't high, high, high level, high security, dangerous stuff that, well, uh, someone on the inside will probably testify against you in court. Like that's a level of organizing where you really need to know people very, very well and you need to work together for many years and um, have trust with one another. And you shouldn't just be accepting random people newly joining your organization. hundred <laughs> percent. should definitely not be happening. hundred percent. I mean, I, like not that long ago, I remember one group uh, called me and was like, someone showed up. Uh, she is very eager, has no backstory. It talks about um, domestic violence though, as why she's become an activist and we think she's a police officer. And the more they explained her behavior and the more they explained what made them worried about her, it was like, I was like, oh, yeah, she's for sure a cop. (laughs) So then it was like, okay, so then how do you organize around her, maneuver around her, you know, not announcing to the whole meeting, like, hey, everybody, uh, I believe there's a cop uh, in our midst. But you render the person ineffective so that it's a waste of police resources and then they just go away. And, you know, that is not easy necessarily to do that, but you can organize to do that. There's no version of that online, though. And this is where the online space is so like, like I have no patience for someone saying this is the correct thing to do online all the time. It's just like, okay, that's, that might be a correct thing to do. That's fine. Like here's some, maybe a basis of facts that we should appeal to. Maybe, maybe you can say, yeah, we tried that. It didn't work, but there's no, like, this is the right thing to do and this wrong thing to do. And I think that the policing of each other's language really gets more and more intense, the less and less power that we feel like we actually have. Yeah. And then there's another way to come at this conversation is like this idea of like the way that we understand the concept of cultural appropriation has shifted since it entered the lexicon and it has shifted massively. And it's like, look, when we first started talking about uh, cultural appropriation, we were talking about the use of of uh, cultural artifacts or, or cultural expressions, behaviors that were being used by dominant society, typically white people, um, in ways that in which they were making money off, like benefiting off of those um, cultural expressions in ways that the the people for whom those cultural expressions came from, it would actually disadvantage them. Like that's the concept. That's what it was. And it it kind of morphed into this sort of like very like capitalistic framing of cultural expressions in that, you know, there are things that people own. So like Nora as an Italian owns pasta, you know, and it's like we have to like. I mean, I do in that no one makes it very well. 
if they're not Italian. And then then we have to like engage with like, can I eat pasta at this event? Um, Or can I wear these types of clothes (laughs) at this event? Um, Because this, or is that wrong? Does that make me a, a wrong person? Or am I doing something bad? Am I doing something racist? Am I doing something xenophobic? And I always thought it was like such a weird thing that we were like moving into this very capitalistic framing in that, uh, like, there's this sort of ownership model over certain types of culture. And, you know, especially as someone who is of the Caribbean, which, you know, like, our, my entire culture wouldn't exist if, if uh, these sorts of conversations were happening back in the day. You know, like, the, <laughs> way, the ways that humans interact with one another and share things with one another and um, the ways that our cultures are able to... to, to uh, to, to share food, blend food, blend traditions is actually quite a beautiful thing. And I think it should be something that we encourage. It's the exploitation of culture and the exploitation of cultural expressions that is a problem. But the way that these conversations like completely lose nuance online, it becomes, you know, I own this phrase because <laughs> I am of this culture and as the owner of this phrase of this culture, I now become um, deployed as the police as well to 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 guard, to safeguard this culture, this cultural expression. And that, I mean, I can't think of something more sad. Like I, I it just it's so depressing um, to 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 engage in something that. Uh, you, you know, culture and something that is a part of you in that way. Like ownership is not good. <laughs> ownership as a concept is a really restrictive and uh, warping concept. It's a, it's a concept that warps our relationship to each other, our relationship to land, our relationship to anything like housing, anything that we need as human beings. And one of the things that we need as human beings is like a system of ways that we relate to one another. And that's what culture is. And I, I really, really, really think that um, the, the making Facebook, Twitter, these social media constructs, like the the place where we arbitrate who is allowed to engage in certain cultures is like, oh, God, we are heading down a really ugly, ugly, ugly road. Mm. But it was also that, like, you know, there was no real ability to have honest conversations because the real conversation, like, these were not the conversations from the left. And I know you're not saying that they were necessarily how the left was always having them. That action of of, of inventing what these issues are coming from the right to confuse people. Because, you know, yes. without capitalism in the conversation, then the conversation gets completely fucking spun out and wacky. And the right isn't going to allow us to have this conversation to be about capitalism and profit and profiting and exploiting. I mean, at the base of it, it is also white uh, capitalism exploiting black culture and ideas and, you know, ways of doing things that has just underpinned American capitalism from the start. And so without that conversation about capital exploitation, at capitalist exploitation, this is where you get these like very spun out and bizarre conversations. And I think that, you know, had the internet not existed, the conversations would have been left up to left-wing spaces in a, you know, in like looking at that exploitative and capitalist angle of this conversation and not allow it to enter into, well, you don't have the right to, to make that food because you're not of that culture. And I should say that like the Italians stole all their food from China, right? Like pretty much everything that we assume to be Chinese, um, that Italian food now is, is actually originally from China. Um, and, and so like that is a really interesting dynamic in this whole, in this whole problem that when everything is flattened into um, a, a, a program that wants us to fight with one another online, mm-hmm. Everything gets fucked up. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking really a lot lately of like, there are people who I really like in real life who I cannot stand what they write online. Like I find it bizarre. It's off-putting. I would say their politics are shit. Uh, It makes me cringe to think I know them. Uh, And I'm I'm talking about like, you know, people I know, I know people I know, people I'm close to. Like, I'm just like, oh my God, that's so cringy. I can't believe you're writing that. And I have to remind myself that if I think that about people who I'm really close to, and I know people think that about me, 
um, what, what, how does that then translate to a stranger? <laughs> you know, like then, then the conversation is, isn't real in the slightest. If I'm dealing with someone who I like and I know them and I find them cringy online, I, I still at least can default to the fact that I know who they are. And sometimes I have seen me inter interacting with someone who I know, and then someone else will jump in like and go for the jugular with the person I know, because they might be saying the wrong thing, and they're saying it the wrong way, they're not expressing themselves right, or if they've got a bad opinion on something, a bad opinion, in my opinion. And it's just like, God, we are so far down the layers of, of social media that we forget that it is a distorting lens, that it is it is a fucking funhouse online. Mm -hmm. And the things that we love the most about certain people, we actually might hate if we met them in real life. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know, yeah, it's fine. And it's like, fuck, like just, God, when it comes to this online stuff, if there's like a way... <laughs> to not do the thing online. Like think about whether or not you can do that. Like if I, if I see Nora say something like totally nuts online and that I completely disagree with, I mean, I have options. I can, you know, go be like, yes, I have been waiting for this since 2012 and like put out like a Twitter thread, uh, to take Nora Loretto down and like, um, have a resulting like break in the podcast or whatever, you know, like <laughs> it will be like some sort of drama, um, that occurs. It starts online and makes its way to the real world or whatever. Or I could call her like, I, I could like be like, Hey, uh, have you thought about this in this way? And like, I, I think about how many like Twitter and uh, Instagram online like devolutions that I see that is like related in that are, between people that I know know each other that is related to, to some of the stuff that we're talking about. And I'm always just like, oh, my gosh, wow, it looks like like this whole relationship is like truly falling apart on this little thing that could probably be resolved if they just had a conversation in person. How bizarre. And again, I think it just goes back to this idea that it's like, like, just, just, you know, I feel like there should be guideposts as to how we like engage online. And one of those guideposts should be, what would a cop want in this circumstance? And if you're accomplishing what a cop would want in that circumstance, see if there's a way to accomplish what you're trying to do, which is maybe like just actually just having people think a little bit more about what they're saying, which is not a bad thing. Um, see if there's a way to do that without accomplishing what a cop would accomplish. Like, can you have a direct conversation with someone that's not going to like result in people not being able to work together anymore or like factioning off, um, uh, groups of people. Like if it's possible to do that and 100% of the time it usually is, <laughs> like, then figure out another way to do it. And just like always ask yourself, am, am, is this cop behavior? Mm -hmm. 